Hi everybody and welcome to The Curious Geographer. Um, I'm so excited today. We are going to be talking about decarbonising industry and our guest is fascinating. She's got so much information. So we're going to be speaking to um, Bemi Olea about her research, who is a um, well, doctor in chemical engineering. And we're going to be um, asking her about her career and how she got to where she is. But what um, Bemi does is, is a lead researcher in a range of projects, both in academia and in industry and looks at how we can achieve net zero in the manufacturing industry. So um, Bemi looks at, re- works with a range of different players from governments to businesses. And so we'll kind of be talking about that. I know we look at that in the A-level geography as well. And then um, she's first started doing her degree in Nigeria, where she did chemical engineering, then went on to do Manchester, up to Manchester to do her PhD d and masters so if you're into the sciences as well this is a really good live interview to see how sciences and geography links so if you haven't already check out my live poster with everything that's going on and if i pass over um to um um to Bemi, if you could introduce yourself to us and um just tell us a little bit about your current role if that's okay yeah thank you thank you ellie um my name is is to bring me. Um, I'm a, an assistant professor at Imperial College London, and I lead a research group that looks at how to um, achieve cost-effective um, digitalization of the industrial sector uh, for society, for government, and also um, for industry. We look at what are the technologies or what and the pathway to support industrial decarbonisation, but also looking at what kind of policies um, can increase uptake of these technologies within the industrial sector. And where, um, if we start with kind of our definitions for the start, what exactly do we mean by um, industrial decarbonisation? All right, so industries, uh, the manufacturing industries are responsible for producing a lot of the products we use, whether it's chocolate or toothpaste or the fuel for our cars or our building our houses, um, for example, the cement industry. And um, decarbonizing industry means get rid, getting rid of all the greenhouse gas emissions produced by industry in order to meet our needs and our wants. So industrial decarbonization is simply removal of greenhouse gases from the manufacturing sector or from industry. And another um, definition we're going to be talking about is net zero. What do we mean by net zero and how can net zero in the manufacturing sector help reduce climate change? All right, so uh, net zero simply refers to um, getting rid of the carbon dioxide sources with sinks. So net zero means that if you add the sources of greenhouse gases from industry uh, and the sinks of greenhouse gases from industry, you have a net zero transition. So for example, if you have a particular plant that is emitting, for example, uh, two ton per CO2, or uh, two two pound per ton of CO two, and next to that plant you've got maybe a a technology that captures CO two from air that is about two ton. Net zero means that the end the net um the, the greenhouse gas emissions from that plant is net zero. And now what's important? So the, the we we know that anthropogenic um. CO2 emissions are responsible for climate change. And the goal of the Paris Agreement is to keep the increase in temperature uh, to about 1.5 degrees. And industrial sector is a big emitter of greenhouse gases. In fact, global is responsible for over 30% of greenhouse gases. So if we can get the emissions from industry to net zero, or if we can decarbonize industry, that means that we've taken care of the 30% uh, CO2 emissions that come from the industrial sector. And that is key uh, to mitigating climate change or to achieving goals of the Paris Agreement. So industry, and again, industry is not just, you know, a big emitter. If you think about 
the other sectors of the economy, for example, transportation, one of the ways to decarbonize the transport sector is to move away from fossil fueled vehicles to electric cars or to encourage people to take a walk instead of driving to the store if it's just next to your house. Industry is also responsible for manufacturing these cars or even these bicycles. And even if you want to take a walk, industry is also responsible for manufacturing the very good shoes that you can use to walk for a long time. The industry is important in that transition to not zero, not just as an emitter, but also as that sector that manufacture a lot of the technologies and products to support the overall change. Um, and you've used the words um, net zero and decarbonizing. Are they words that we can use interchangeably or do they mean slightly different things? I think until 2050, there are words we can use interchangeably because um, the, the global consensus is to get to net zero by 2050 and that's what we define as decarbonisation. However, after 2050, if the target changes to zero, uh, then decarbonisation means getting to zero. So I guess I can say from now until 2050, decarbonisation means getting the manufacturing or the industrial sector to net zero. Brilliant. And I really like how you linked the different aspects that companies could be, for example, manufacturing. If a company is manufacturing a car that is also going to increase greenhouse emissions, can you ever call it? Could it ever be um, decarbonized or net zero because it's it's producing something that is going to produce more emissions later? Uh, now, there are different ways to see how a car is manufactured. So in the manufacturing process of a car, it's possible to capture the CO2 emissions such that, you know, the manufacturing um, boundary is, is net zero. Um, now, in the use of its car, of the car, it's also possible to use clean fuels uh, like hydrogen, such that in the use of its car, uh, in the use of a car by individuals, there are no emissions. Or it's possible to manufacture electric vehicles in a clean way, so that you capture the CO2 from the manufacturing processes. And in the use of the car, of course, renewable electricity will be used to charge the vehicle. So it's, you know, looking at the whole supply chain from manufacturing to end use to make sure that it's end zero. I mean, the, the technologies or the concepts to support decarbonizing the production of any product is known. Uh, so it is possible to to get net zero. Brilliant. And I like that kind of the difference that you spoke and you spoke also about the whole um, our importance in terms of mitigating for climate change um, as well. Um, one of the um, issues or challenges that you talk about is making this transition cost effective. So we've talked about businesses and obviously businesses also want to create profits and will if companies decarbonize, will prices suddenly go up? What's the what's the issue with being cost effective? So the goal of the transition is to support decarbonization of industry, but to make sure it's done cost effectively. So what that means is I've got the spend. Um, if <laughs> if the current production process for the spend from the raw material to the manufacturing side, to the store where buy it from is decarbonized, we we don't want the cost of the spend to double. And that's what we mean. Cost effective means that if at all the price increases, perhaps it can increase from 99p to one pound, similar to an inflation increase. And the key to cost effective uh, transition of industry is adequate policy support. So adequate international agreements to generate enough demand such that we can sustain um, the transition. So what that means that, you know what, if with adequate policy support, for instance, if I go into a store to buy a pen, um, if we get to a stage where each pen has its emission footprint printed somewhere, then I can make the right decision to pick up a pen with a lower carbon footprint, and that will increase the demand on the side of the manufacturer to produce a spend. And hopefully with increased demand, we can drive down cost. That's brilliant. Um, 
Brilliant. And you've talked about working with different people that, or different um, organisations that we're going to come on to next as well. But link into it, it seems quite similar to students learn about um, sustainability, the concept. And in geography, we look at how it's important for people, the economy and the environment um, and how it's not just, for example, environmental. It, it needs to make sure that people can still make money and businesses and it also benefits people. Um, how would you um, define sustainable um, or sustainable energy systems from your background and expertise? Right. Thank you, Ellie. You mentioned three important themes. You mentioned people, the economy and the environment. So I'm going to define a sustainable energy system based on this tree. So sustainable energy system has the lowest environmental impact. So that's the environment. A sustainable energy system is affordable. That's economy. And a sustainable energy system is socially responsible so that's related to people so we want an equitable social environment uh, for a system to be called a sustainable energy system and um, and going on to with the or different organizations that we talked about how important are international agreements you mentioned it in terms of the pen and kind of um making sure that it can still be cost effective so how important are international agreements and also even national um policies on decarbonizing industry now the the impact of a policy is usually to support a transition or to create some form of certainty of what the future will look like. So if I look at the boundaries of a country, for instance, the United Kingdom passing into law a net zero greenhouse gas target by 2050, that creates a strong uh, policy framework to let industry, transports, electricity, know that we've got to achieve net zero industries also sends a strong signal to finance uh, institutions to know that the future is going to involve, you know, what growing a green economy. So uh, a, a national agreement like that is necessary to create a market, uh, it's necessary to create a market that can support that transition. Now, if you look at local, uh, well, national agreements like that, so if the UK, for instance, agrees to say we're going to get to net zero by 2050, most of the industries in the UK trade globally, right? So if I'm a manufacturer who manufactures cars that I sell to other countries, um, if the UK passes into law that kind of ambition, and if it's not going to be cost effective for me to transition, there is a possibility that I might move to another country that is not as ambitious as the UK. So even by the move, it's possible that the UK's emission reduces. However, Globally, CO2 emissions will continue to increase because one country making ambitious laws and other countries not making ambitious laws doesn't help the global CO2 emissions. And at the end of the day, it is global warming, not UK warming. So this is where the importance of international agreement comes in. If the UK agrees to net zero, if the US agrees to net zero, um, I mean, 50 or more countries have agreed to net zero. That means that we create an international buzz. I liken it to the buzz that comes when a new iPhone is released all over the world. That means we create these international boards that send a strong signal to the market, to financial institutions, to industry, and this begins to create a demand uh, for clean products. And we will see cost falling quite rapidly because everyone has agreed. And also, no one feels left out um, in, in terms of the transition to net zero. And I think that's the only way we can achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement quickly and on time. And that's the only way we can truly mitigate climate change international agreements. Brilliant. I think that's so interesting what you talked about saying how every, um, just to go over a really good point for A-level students, how it's the role of all the countries to make sure that they are also promoting um, or aiming for net zero. And I really liked how you talked about that actually 
if a company thinks that they can just use their manufacturing in another sector, in another country, then what's to stop them moving if there's no regulations in that country as well, or the regulations aren't as strict. So I think that's a really interesting thing that saying it re- it really does rely the international agreements on the whole um, whole world um, you, aiming for net zero. Do you, um, you um, helped or were part of the research group for the um, in for COP26 um, the, and I think you were uh, providing some um, evidence um, to the governments as well. Um, what, how important is it for you to, um, I was gonna, well, I, I don't really, I know, I just wanna see from your experience um, and working with um, governments, do they rely on your research and then they take that forward? And do you, countries have different aims for net zero? around the world? So I was part of the uh, strategic advisory board uh, for the UK's industrial decarbonisation strategy as an academic um, who works in industrial decarbonisation. And I've also provided evidence to parliament uh, by co-authoring an essay on uh, cost-effective industrial decarbonisation. I think um, researchers, not just me, uh, all the researchers in, in this game have provided some form of evidence to government, whether directly or indirectly. So directly could be maybe um, speaking to parliamentarian or co-authoring an essay with them. Indirectly could be through the papers we publish, which most times are referred to when it's com- when it um, when it comes to designing a strategy uh, to get a particular sector to net zero. So if I refer to the UK's industrial decarbonisation strategy that contains the know-how, so the concepts of decarbonised industry by 2050, but also so uh, the policy support required to make that transition um, happen. Uh, yes, um, yes, um, it's, uh, it's, it's always good to communicate with experts because you are able to cover the entire uh, value chain of industry and you're able to, it's, it's possible to make sure that the technologies or the concepts um, in that strategy are ready to go, or have a high TRL or the barriers to adoption have been carefully addressed. Um, and another uh, well, uh, player, we would maybe call it a geography, um, who you've worked on is um, working with businesses. And I was wondering, we, meant, we talked when we were talking before this interview about whether there was a company who has like almost successfully ish decarbonized and if you could give an example of maybe one company who is who is um yeah doing well at their kind of decarbonizing the industry as a um as a business one company that comes to mind is equatricity uh i think they are known as a britain's greener green energy um and craft uh, i like equatricity uh because they, I mean, it's, it's majorly energy from wind, uh, so green electricity, but they also have uh, somewhat of a, a carbon calculator. Uh, so students, adults, uh, we can all play around with it to see the carbon footprint of our decisions surrounding products we each of the day. So I will say electricity uh, if you want to call it. Um, I mean, there's so many companies in the UK that have uh, started to um, prepare or to strategize on how to get that zero. I saw the other day, it came up with my Yahoo feed about McDonald's uh, and, and, you know, um, getting what their strategy is get to net zero, um, Burger King. So a lot of people are picking up on these um, ambitions to make sure that, you know, their, 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 their companies also get to net zero. So I'd probably say to students to go and have a look because it's probably on a lot of companies' websites as well. So you can kind of go and see um, what that your company is doing in terms of decarbonising if you're interested in one. And I've just shared the link um, to um, Ecotricity um, so students can go and click on that um, as well. Um, I was So our final question we've been asking all guests is how do they get in there? into their careers now you actually knew that you wanted to be a chemical engineer from when you were very young so if you wouldn't mind telling us um how did you get to where you are today and then finally do you have advice for students who are 
ending their school age. So we're mainly talking about A-level students who are thinking about going on to university or their next steps. All right. So um, I remember when I was nine, um, I had the opportunity. I grew up in Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is an oil rich state. Uh, so I had the opportunity to visit um, an, an oil rig when I was nine years old. And I had to wear my little hat back and my little coverall. And uh, we went, we're in the control room and I was fascinated by a picture that I saw. Now that picture showed how, you know, what raw materials are converted into products in different sides of the plant. And I told the tour guide that, oh, I would like to be able to produce this picture when I grow up. And he said, you've got to be a chemical engineer. And I made up my mind there and then to be a chemical engineer. Um, I mean, if you said you've got to be an artist, I'll probably have been an awful artist, but <laughs> good thing he said you're a chemical engineer. And so that, that kind of formed my, my decision from that point going forward. I didn't know so much about chemical engineering. I was that I wanted to produce. So of course I went to high school, I finished, I went to college, I went to university. My first choice was chemical engineering. I think then in Nigeria you choose three, three, you have three choices. The first the first degree of chemical engineering is a good thing. I got the grade to get in. And after I graduated, I went on to work for an engineering uh, design firm where I had the opportunity to produce or to uh, work in teams to do conceptual design of chemical processes. And at the end, uh, I thought that was all, actually. That's what I wanted to do anyway. And, and I thought that you need some energy to drive the processes. And I also got to know about sustainability of the processes, making sure that the products are safe for the environment. So I decided to do a master's in the UK because they had a course that was offering how to design uh, processes in a cleaner way um, or how to use clean energy for industrial processes. So I came to University of Manchester for my master's in advanced process design and I learned a lot about the design of processes, uh, low carbon industrial processes. And after that, I went into work in the industry for two years and I wanted to do more research in this area. So I did a PhD. Uh, looking at the industrial sector, getting to low carbon, because this was in 2012, net zero was in the topic, low carbon was the agenda in 2012. So I successfully worked with a major uh, energy intensive industry afterwards to help to transition their processes to, to low carbon. Um, and after which I got a job in Imperial College, I moved to London because I wanted to learn uh, this multidisciplinary thinking when it comes to the process industry. And I've been in London since 2016, uh, working at Imperial College doing research on industry, but in the interface of technology, economics, and policy support. Uh, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, I decided on time, uh, but some people, it's okay to take your time to decide what you want to study, as long as you have that inspiration or go for something you're enthusiastic uh, or passionate about, because uh, I'll say it's not an easy, <laughs> It's not an easy transition, uh, but, but if you are passionate about it in times when it becomes challenging or when it becomes uh, a burden or when it becomes a bearing, you will be able to, to go through it. So my advice for students uh, is simple. Um, do what you're passionate about. Um, it could, in there are different branches of geography, different branches of science different branches of engineering, do what you're passionate about. And if you've not found a passion, take your time and explore more areas, um, you, you will find uh, the passion. I didn't get the last question. Do you mind? Uh... Yeah, the, the last question that we um, I did, and it just was there any student's advice? Was it that one? Yes, yeah, so it's a student ending school, so finishing yeah. from college. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. So, uh, well, if you're if you're thinking from college, you've probably already decided the subject <laughs> you want to study. Uh, so, going into uni, uh, going with an open mind. Of course, your primary um, objective is to study, but learn something new, a sport, get to meet new people, um, engage in some form of leadership activity to help you learn those transferable skills for the future. And don't be shy to ask questions when it's not clear. If I re if I rewind back to my nine-year-old self looking at that picture without asking the question I want to be able to produce is, I'll probably not be here by now. So uh, don't think the question is foolish. I said this a lot to uh, first-year students. No question is stupid. So please feel free to ask questions as we come into the end of college so you're better informed of the choices you need to make or you have good information to make the right choice when it comes to a course to study or a career. Um, most universities have a, a fair, a, an open day. Um, that's your opportunity to ask all the questions in the world before you get to the interview stage. So exhaust it, uh, that opportunity. And, and yeah, that's my advice. That's brilliant. That's such good advice. And it's so nice hearing um, how you got to where you are. And it's so, it sounds like you've had such great experience in all the places that you've studied and your knowledge is amazing. Um, I definitely could not even think about the detail that you must look at things in terms of from a chemical engineering side as well and then I think kind of how you've managed to link it all together um, in your current role looking at policies and looking at businesses and working with so many people um, is really fantastic and a great inspiration for students to look up to once you kind of pick pick your choices so thank you so so much for taking your time um, to chat to, uh, to us about this and um, yeah from us in the Crystal Film we wish you um, the best of luck um, in your new projects that you're going to be doing and thank you massively for sharing the information and particularly talking about net zero and decarbonising. Well, thank you Elito, thank you for your time, thank you for the opportunity and to everyone who is watching or who watches this video, thank you for watching. I'll just say goodbye to our guests and then I'll um, just to let everybody know. So next week, everybody, just so you know, in no, two weeks time, we're speaking to Danny Dawling about Fintopia, which is his new book. So please join us. Um, it will be, what can we learn from the world's happiest country? Um, so definitely check that out if you are studying A-level geography. So um, goodbye from, from both of us and have a lovely, um, lovely rest of your evening. And um, that's everything from me. Bye.